Welcome back. We start our news bulletin from Pakistan, which has rejected baseless Indian allegations of infiltration attempts and unfounded claims of targeting launching pads across the line of control. Addressing a weekly press briefing in Islamabad, Foreign Office spokesperson Aisha Farooqi said the Indian propaganda machine is in overdrive. She said Pakistan rejects provocative statements of the Indian Defence Minister, including his preposterous claim that India was dominating the enemy. Farooqi said India seeks to use his allegations as a pretext for a false flag operation. Meanwhile, Foreign Officer has summoned Indian Charity Affairs Gaurav Aluwalia to protest ceasefire violation along the line of control. In a statement, Foreign Office said two women and a soldier were martyred by Indian troops unprovoked firing in Rakhchiri sector yesterday. The office told Indian envoys such senseless acts are in clear violation of 2003 ceasefire understanding. It urged India to allow UN Military Observer Group in India and Pakistan to play its role as per UNSC resolutions. The office said 2002 alone India has committed 919 ceasefire violations and targeted civilian populations. Meanwhile, Pakistan's Prime Minister Imran Khan says India is using the COVID-19 pandemic to intensify the genocide of Kashmiris. Khan said Prime Minister Narendra Modi's government is continuing its fascist RSS-driven ideology and carrying out war crimes in the valley. Khan said the Modi regime is violating the Fourth Geneva Convention by attempting to change the demography of the disputed region. He said international community has a responsibility to take note of and act against these war crimes. The Prime Minister said Kashmir issue is recognized as disputed by the United Nations. The Prime Minister highlighted recent arrest of Kashmiri journalists under controversial Unlawful Activities Prevention Act. Under this law, the Indian government can keep the arrested people in jail for up to seven years. Now, in a related development, the government of Indian occupied Kashmir has told the Supreme Court that the right to access the internet is not a fundamental right. The top court was hearing a petition filed by the Foundation for Media Professionals for restoring 4G internet access in the valley. In its reply, the government said free speech and expression, including trade and internet access, can be curtailed in general public interest. It said the internet ban is not only least restrictive, but also most appropriate and has reasonable nexus with the purpose to achieve state security. Targeting Pakistan, authorities claim that high-speed internet restoration will lead to the glorification of Pakistan army and freedom fighters. They said lifting ban will lead to swift uploading and posting of provocative videos and other heavy data files. The Occupied Valley is reeling under New Delhi's crushing curfew and communications blackout for the past 269 days. In Pakistan, over 4,000 coronavirus-infected patients have recovered. The death toll in the country has risen to 346 after 19 more died in the last 24 hours. The Health Ministry reported 874 new confirmed cases of the virus in the last 24 hours, bringing the total to over 15,700. Meanwhile, American business magnate Bill Gates has lauded Pakistan's efforts in the fight against the COVID-19. In a telephonic call with Prime Minister Imran Khan, Gates said Pakistan has protected lives and livelihoods of vulnerable populations. In the U.S., the death toll from the new coronavirus has surged to nearly 61,000 as over 2,600 people died in the last 24 hours. The disease has now killed over 227,000 worldwide while infecting nearly 3.2 million. More in this report. With the global economy in tatters, the International Labour Organization has warned that COVID-19 will cost half of the world's jobs. But in the absence of a vaccine, the mounting debts continue to merit restrictions. Germany has extended its strict travel warning, while UK continues to read from the pandemic. We're moving to an improved daily reporting uh, system for deaths, so that deaths in all settings are included wherever the individual has tested positive for COVID-19, rather than just those in hospitals. And those figures show that uh, up to yesterday on the new measure, uh, we have recorded an additional 3,811 deaths in total. 
A ray of hope emerged after a recent study showed that Gilead's experimental drug is extremely effective against the disease. But U.S. infectious disease official Anthony Fauci insists the data on Gilead's drug needs to be further analyzed. The data shows that remdesivir has a clear-cut significant positive effect in diminishing the time to recovery. This is really quite important for a number of reasons, and I'll give you the data. It's highly significant. World Health Organization Chief Tedros Adhanom has dispelled mounting pressure and criticism by the U.S. and its allies. The U.N. Health Bodies Chief said the organization had acted quickly and decisively against the novel coronavirus. Meanwhile, South Korea has reported no new domestic COVID-19 cases for the first time since February. China says it has no interest in interfering in the U.S. presidential elections in November. Foreign Ministry spokesperson Gang Shuang said the quadrennial election was the internal affair of the U.S. Talking to the reporters during a daily briefing, Shuang said Beijing hoped Washington will not try to drag China into it. This comes after U.S. President Donald Trump said that Beijing will do anything it can to make him lose November's elections. Trump said China will prefer the presumptive Democratic nominee former Vice President Joe Biden over him. He said Beijing will want to ease the pressure his administration has placed on it regarding trade and other issues. The Arab League says it is meeting virtually today to galvanize opposition to Israel's plans to annex Palestinian lands. The meeting is being conducted at the request of the Palestinian leadership. The MOOT will bring together Arab foreign ministers via video conference due to the coronavirus pandemic. On Monday, the League's Deputy Secretary Hossam Zaki said the meeting will discuss providing legal and financial support to the Palestinian leadership. Last week, Arab League Secretary General Ahmad Abul Ghaid said the annexation plans endanger regional peace. Joe Biden, the presumptive Democratic presidential, says he will keep the U.S. Embassy in Israel in Jerusalem if elected. Speaking to reporters in Boston, Biden said he will instead reopen a second consulate in East Jerusalem to engage with the Palestinians. The Democratic presidential hopeful said he does not agree with the context of President Donald Trump's decision. He said moving the embassy without the conditions having been met was short-sighted and frivolous. Turkey says it has killed four militants of the Kurdistan Workers' Party in northern Syria. The defense ministry says the fighters were killed during Operation Peace Spring. The ministry said it will not stop the operations against militants in the region. Meanwhile, the ministry said Turkish and Russian forces conducted their seventh joint patrol on a key highway on Syria's northwestern border. It said the troops from the two countries carried out land and aerial inspections in Idlib. The patrolling is a part of an agreement brokered between Turkey and Russia on March 5th in Moscow. Germany has banned the Iran-backed Hezbollah on its soil and designated it a terrorist organization. The decision was revealed by German Interior Ministry spokesperson on its official Twitter account. The spokesman said the police are conducting raids across the country to arrest members of this group. Security officials said up to 1,050 people in Germany are part of the extremist wing. Germany had previously distinguished between Hezbollah's political arm and its military units, but it has for the first time declared the entire political group as a terrorist organization. Iran's ambassador to the UN has called US efforts to extend an arms embargo a breach of Security Council Resolution 2231. In an interview, Majid Takht Ravanchi called Washington's claim of still being a part of JCPOA an unprecedented joke. He said Security Council members should pay heed to the fact any such moves by Washington violate UN resolutions. Earlier, the US said it will not let Iran buy conventional arms even after a UN embargo on Tehran expires in October. Speaking in Washington, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo said the U.S. will work with the U.N. Security Council to extend the embargo. He urged Britain, France and Germany to back U.S. efforts to force the snapback 
of all UN sanctions on Iran. The UN Security Council has expressed concerns over the declaration of self-rule by the Southern Transitional Council in Aden City. In a statement, the Council said STC's actions can sabotage the efforts of UN envoy Martin Griffiths to secure a nationwide ceasefire. The 15-member Council reaffirmed its strong commitment to Yemen's unity, sovereignty, independence and territorial integrity. It called on the stakeholders for the expediting implementation of the Riyadh Agreement. The Council also urged Yemeni government expediting implementation of the Riyadh Agreement. The Council also urged Yemeni government and Houthis to reach an agreement in lieu of Griffith's proposal. Meanwhile, the STC has declared a three-day, 24-hour curfew in a bid to curb the spread of the novel coronavirus in Aden. Yemen has reported... We're taking a short break, but stay tuned for more news. Welcome back. Libya's Eastern Forces Commander Khalifa Haftar has announced a unilateral ceasefire during the holy month of Ramadan. The Eastern Army spokesman Ahmad Al Mizmari said any breach of the truce by their rivals will be followed by a harsh response. Mizmari said the ceasefire came at the request of the international community and friendly countries. He said the LNA has the right to respond to any military action and they had not given up on their aims. LNA's truce comes after Haftar nullified the UN unity deal of 2015 and declared himself the ruler of Libya. Meanwhile, the UN-recognized government has filed a complaint to France for the unpermitted presence of its military aircraft over Misrata. In Sierra Leone, a riot has broken out at the central prison in the capital Freetown, after the confirmation of a coronavirus case there. A spokesperson for Freetown's Padema Road Prison said that a guard has been killed and dozens of inmates and guards wounded. The information ministry said authorities were still collecting information about injuries and damage to the facility. Security forces were deployed around the prison and residents in the area are ordered to stay indoors. Firefighters later put out a major blaze while prisoners who tested positive were taken to a treatment facility. The West African nation has so far confirmed 104 cases of the virus and four deaths. Kenya has banned the movement in and out of two refugee camps hosting 400,000 people to prevent the spread of COVID-19. Health experts and humanitarian groups have long warned that the virus outbreak in densely populated refugee camps will be catastrophic. Interior Minister Fred Mitiangi said restrictions apply to the Dab camp in the east, which is home to over 217,000 people. He said curbs are also imposed on Kakuma camp in northwestern Kenya, home to some 190,000 people. Kenya has not imposed a full lockdown, but a dusk to dawn curfew and has blocked movement in and out of Nairobi. Health authorities in several Muslim countries have confirmed new cases and related deaths due to the novel coronavirus. The government of the war-torn country of Yemen announced five new infections in the capital, Aden. Saudi Arabia announced 1,325 new virus cases and 169 recoveries, taking the total number of infections to over 21,000. Deaths in the kingdom now stand at 157 after five new fatalities were recorded. In Qatar, the total number of cases stands at 1,200 and 564. Doha's health ministry said 10 people have died so far, while over 1,200 have recovered. Lebanon's cases rose to 721 with 150 recoveries and a total of 24 deaths. Bahrain has recorded 2,921 cases and 8 deaths from the virus. The death toll in Kuwait has risen 24 with one more fatality while the total cases stand at 3,740. Turkey confirmed 89 more fatalities from the virus over the past 24 hours bringing the total death to over 3,000. Ankara's health ministry said the total number of cases surged to over 117,000 as nearly 3,000 more people tested positive. 
Russia says it has flown two nuclear-capable strategic bombers over the neutral waters of the Baltic Sea. The move prompted Finland, Denmark, Poland and Sweden to scramble jets to escort them. Moscow said the flight was routine in nature and strictly adhered to international airspace regulations. Russia's defense ministry said the two Tupolev T-160 aircraft were in air for eight hours. The bombers are capable of carrying up to 12 short-range nuclear missiles. Russia carries out similar training flights over the Arctic, Atlantic and Pacific Oceans as well as over the Black and Baltic Seas on a regular basis. Some NATO members have regarded Moscow's policy as unhelpful. The death toll from the fire at a construction site has risen to 38 in the South Korean city of Ixian. Rescue officials say most of the 38 victims were construction workers building a four-story warehouse. Firefighters continue to carry out search and rescue operation overnight. The police along with the rescue authorities have launched a joint investigation to determine the exact cause of the fire. Officials believe an explosion in an underground level of the warehouse sparked the fire. Firefighters said victims were unable to evacuate as the fire spread quickly. Rishi Kapoor, the legend of the Indian film industry, has passed away at a private hospital in Mumbai today. Kapoor was diagnosed with leukemia in 2018 and returned to India last September after a year-long course of treatment in New York. The 67-year-old actor was taken to hospital yesterday after he complained of breathing difficulties. In a statement, actor's family said, Kapoor was grateful for the love of his fans poured from the world over. The family asked fans to stay at home due to the movement restrictions imposed due to COVID-19 pandemic. Rishi Kapoor debuted as a child actor in 1970 in his father Raj Kapoor's film. The deceased actor belonged to the Indian film industry's famous Kapoor family. One of the world's largest lunar meteorites goes on private sale at Christie's in London today. It has been valued at $2.49 million. The moon rock weighing over 13.5 kilograms was probably struck off the surface of the moon by a collision with an asteroid or comet. It is thought to be the fifth largest piece of the moon ever found on Earth. There is just 650 kilograms of moon rock known to be on Earth. Like many meteorites that are discovered, it was found in the Sahara by an anonymous founder, then changed hands. In the 60s and 70s, the Apollo program brought back about 400 kilograms of moon rock with them. And scientists have been able to analyze the chemical and isotopic compositions of those rocks. And they've determined that they match certain meteorites that have been discovered. So we're absolutely certain that these rocks do in fact come from the lunar surface. U.S. plane maker Boeing plans to ax 16,000 jobs in a drastic round of cost-cutting due to the coronavirus pandemic. The grounding of Boeing 737 MAX plane also led to this massive job cut. In a statement, Boeing CEO Dave Calhoun said, The demand for commercial airline travel has fallen off a cliff. He said the pandemic is dealing a blow to the company's business. Calhoun said, a temporary shutdown of its factories in Washington state cost the company over $100 million. The company lost $1.7 billion from its core operations in the first quarter of 2020. Plane makers, airlines and suppliers have been left reeling by the pandemic, which has crippled passenger travel and affected major economies. European stock markets are trading lower as investors monitor quarterly corporate earnings and economic data. London's FTSE 100 and Frankfurt stacks are trading fractionally lower. CAC 14 Paris is trading marginally higher. Oil giant Royal Dutch Shell stocks plummeted 7.5% after it reported first quarter net income declined 46%. In Asia, Nikkei 2 to 5 led the gains, closing over 2% higher. Shanghai Composite and Seoul's Kospi gained ground. Meanwhile, international benchmark Brent crude oil is trading over 7% higher.
managed to get the weather from around the globe. This is all for now. For the latest updates, you can follow us on social media at Indus.news.